All right. Good morning, everyone. So uh, don't forget, Wednesday will be virtual. Okay, so again, I'll be home with my son on that day. Uh, so Wednesday, we'll probably just do a review uh, for the exam on Friday. And then Thursday, since we're already, we'll be done with all the stuff today for the exam. So we'll probably just start the next section on Thursday. So Thursday, we'll start magnetic fields before the actual exam on then Friday. So okay. just get a little bit ahead. So that way I can actually teach for the first time in like four years, RC, AC circuits. Great. I'm supposed to actually cover that and I've never actually made it that far. So <laughs> we'll see. So I have high hopes for this semester. We'll see whatever. So one thing just I wanted to point out uh, before I let you guys work on the group assignments, which looks like some of you actually already did that. So it's fine. <laughs> is uh, sometimes in particular circuits, it might be easier to first use what you know about parallel and series to combine certain sections together before you apply Kirchhoff's loop rules. And basically what that means is like in this session here, I have no battery. So as long as I have no battery in any part of this section here, what I can do then is I can actually combine R3 and R4, which are in series together and then combine R3, 4, which is in parallel with R5, to then create the one leg here, which then only has one resistor. So basically what I mean is, I can actually combine all these things down, to so rewrite this as, here's my battery, connected to R1, connected to R2, connected to the second battery. But now over here, I just have one leg, which has one resistor of R3, 4, 5. R1, R2, E1, E2. So in that case, I don't have to apply the junction rule and the loop rule to these things and then come up with currents that way. So here it's actually a lot easier just to combine all three of these resistors down to one resistor. So now I only have these two junctions instead of having these junctions plus these junctions. So now I have three unknown currents to solve for instead of the number I have here. So here I have what, one current, two currents, three currents, four currents, five currents, and six currents. Here I only have now three currents to solve for. It now has reduced the size of what I have to solve from a, actually a six by seven matrix now to a three by four matrix. A lot easier to solve that way. Once I then do that, I'm now gonna find the current through here, find the current through here, find the current through here. Now I would apply Ohm's law going backwards to what I came from here to then figure out the current through each one of these guys. So sometimes it's a little bit easier to first combine everything down together, as long again as there's no battery in this section. If there was a battery in that section, I can't do that. Then I strictly have to use Kirchhoff's loop. So that's all I kind of wanted to point out here. Uh, I did post the outside of class extra credit this morning. So that is now available. So you can work on that. And so that's all I want to kind of cover right here. So the next thing is, I'll set that you guys work on these group problems. We'll talk about these real quick. Give you about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so to kind of get us to start on these. And then after that, we'll work on the remaining part of this chapter, which is RC circuits. So we'll talk about some RC circuits. So here, this is the first one. So this one says that we have this circuit below. So this guy here. So this then says that R1 here is 100, R2 is 200, R3 is 300, R4 is 150. And then I have the two batteries where this one is 15 volts and this is 10 minutes. So from here, all I want to do then is find the current that flows through each one of the different resistors. Now, one thing I've seen in the past, I've asked this question a lot on exams. And just because I ask you the current which runs through each resistor doesn't mean I have to have a separate current through each resistor. For example, R1 and R2 are in series with the battery, which means that all of this through here has to have exactly the same current. So what I've seen on exams in the past is, people say, well, this is a resistor, it has to have I1 going through it. This is a resistor, it has to have I2 going through it. This is a resistor, this is I3, and this is another resistor, so this is I4, so I have four currents, but there's only three legs. So don't invent a current just because I asked you for a current going through a resistor. They can have the same current. So in this case, the current through R1 is the same as current through R2, as you can see here in the answer. But again, just because I ask you the current going through each resistor doesn't mean each resistor has to have its own separate current. So I'll see the diagram, they'll kind of draw I2 here, then I1 here, and it's like, no. So anyway, the other thing is, 
This may seem weird. So I have this leg going through here, this leg through here, and this leg through here. So I've given it in a different way that you're used to seeing it. But you can always redraw these things and move them any way that you want to, as long as you don't change the order in which things are happening. Which means I could actually redraw this resistor here, or the circuit. So if I redraw this, let's bring up the picture again. So basically, all I'm going to do is I'm going to move this node down, which moves this leg over here, to then draw it in the usual format, which we're used to. So I can actually easily redraw this as here's E1, here's R1, here's R2. So I haven't done anything fancy here. But I'm just going to move R3 through here. So this is now R3. R4 is now here. And now here's the EMF E2. This circuit is exactly the same as the other one. The reason for that is because we pretend that wires have zero resistance to us. So I can move the wires and extend the wires and do anything I want to without changing the overall resistance of the circuit. So I haven't actually changed anything. All I've done is I've moved this node from here down to here and pulled the rest of this over here. So this circuit is exactly the same as the other one. So sometimes it's just easier to redraw the circuit, put it into a format which you're used to seeing it, and then analyze the circuit from there. So that's the first one. So that's not too bad, nice and easy. The second one in, something similar. So this is we have resistor R1, which has one ohm. So this has one ohm, one ohm, one ohm, and one ohm. And then resistor R2 is two ohms, which is this one. And that's connected to three batteries where this has two volts, two volts, and this is four volts, and this is four volts. So here I want to know what's the magnitude of the current and the direction of the currents through each resistor. So basically meaning is the current going this way or is it going this way? Same thing here, is it going up, is it going down? Is it going this way or is it going this way? That's what that just means by direction. And then finally, what's the potential difference between two points, the two junctions, point A and point B? Now, when it comes to potential difference, since this portion here is in parallel with this portion here, which is in parallel with this portion here, what I know then is that the potential difference between A and B going this way, potential going between A and B going this way, or the potential going from A to B this way are all the same. Which means if I want to know the potential difference between these two points, I can either use this portion, the left leg, this portion, the middle leg, or this portion, the right leg. Either one will give me exactly the correct answer. Doesn't matter. Because they're in parallel with each other. So when you're trying to then determine the potential difference between two points, the best thing I say is use the easiest path, which means the path which has the less amount of crap. In this case, that's the middle leg. Middle leg, there's only two things, this guy and this guy. Here I have three things, here I have three things, use the one that's the easiest. Now when it also comes to that, don't automatically assume that this is a potential drop. Because it may not be. It depends on the direction in which the current is going. So if I start off here and I go in this direction, if the current is going this way into this battery here, what that means then is what? I have a potential increase due to this resistor, not a potential drop. So it depends on the direction in which the currents are going. That's the point of part A is to tell you the direction in which the current is going. The current's going down in this direction, start here, I have a potential increase in the battery, potential increase from the resistor, which means I have a higher potential up here. If the current is actually going this way, in that case, I have a potential drop. So I have a potential increase, potential drop, which then gives me a little bit lower potential at the other side. Okay with us? So like I said, I'll give you about, know, about kind of 20 minutes to kind of work on these, ask questions, get a little more practice. After that, we'll start RC circuits. We'll have to do some more calculus. Bring up the first one. What do you want to work on? And one thing I'll promise is on the exam, there will be a curious cost of the problem. Will be. Well, one similar to like this, only three legs. Nothing too big. <clears throat>
so much way easier. Like circuitry? Yeah. This Remember to follow your steps. Thank you. 
One. one thing I do want to point out about the second one is notice that all three of these batteries are forcing current in the same direction. Which means that this one has a current trying to flow this way, this one has a current trying to flow this way, this one also has a current trying to flow this way, meaning that all three of them are trying to push current in the same direction, which is not possible. Right? Because I have to have as much current going into a junction as I have coming away, which means whenever you run into a situation like this, one of these three batteries is then being charged. So what you're doing is you're using two of these batteries, actually these two, the force current into this node, the force current actually going in the wrong direction through this battery, which means you're actually charging this battery. This is what happens when you plug in your cell phone or your laptop or something into an outlet. You're actually forcing the current to flow through it in the wrong direction which causes it to charge. The way you can easily typically tell which one of these three is being charged is the one with the lowest potential. The one which has the lowest potential is the one which is being charged because it doesn't have enough force or potential or work to be able to force the charge going away from it, which means in this case, this, this one has the lowest EMF, this one is the one that's being charged. So this current should go this way, this current should go this way, well, this current has to go through the battery in this direction. So this is actually a charging situation. So the way you can tell if a battery is being charged or not is the direction of the current. If the current is going into the battery, that means it's being charged. If it's going away from the battery, that means it's being discharged. So just want to point that out here. <clears throat> so I could ask a sneaky question like that on the exam one of these batteries being charged or not. I'm going to go ahead and 
because of the junction in there, and it has to be the Unless, oh, right. oh, you're the only way that would be true is if you have infinite amount of time still in mind. When I have done it, it's like about resistance on like Spartan. Right. And then the curve would just be like, well, hold on, I'm not going through there. So it would all just go through the one. Okay. All right. Which is basically what happens is when, remember, in lab, you're back. Start talking about RC circuits. So let's finish off this chapter. So let's talk about the last part. So the last thing we're going to start talking about is what happens if we start putting resistors and capacitors together into a circuit? So what type of circuit do we actually create in that case? And that's what we shorthandedly call an RC circuit. So typically what happens depends on if I'm going to charge the circuit or discharge the circuit. So let's first kind of talk about charging. So let's say that initially, I have a battery connected to a resistor connected to a capacitor and let's put them all into series just to make this a little bit easier. And let's say that initially at T is equal to zero, I have zero charge on my system. So here I have zero charge on the plate. So as we talked about, what will happen is I'm going to start to charge the capacitor plate by simply moving one charge here going through the resistor onto the capacitor plate, and we have to do zero work to do that. Right? So I'm going to have one, say, positive charge move through here, and I'm going to put that charge then onto the plate. But once I put that charge onto the plate, this now is going to have a Coulombic repulsion between this positive charge. So now I have to do work to overcome this Coulomb repulsion to then put this check and charge onto there, <laughs> which means that it's going to be harder for that charge to get pushed onto there. Now, as I then start putting more and more charges on there, that Coulomb repulsion gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which means I have to do more work, which means the charges are going to move slower and slower and slower for me to move that charge from this portion to this portion. Okay? 
which basically means that initially when I hook this thing up, I should have zero charge on the capacitor plate. So the charge then is going to increase. It's going to increase rather rapidly, but then it's going to start slowing down and taking more and more amount of time for me to put this charge on. But if I think about the current, initially when I close this switch or say when I put this thing on there, the charges are going to flow as rapidly as possible. They're going to flow as if the capacitor didn't exist here, which means they're going to flow at a rate of E divided by R by Ohm's law. But as more charges get onto here, the rate is then going to slow down because now the charges can't move as quickly because now they have to try to overcome this coulombic repulsion trying to get them to move on to the charge. Right? So basically think about if I was running down here, initially I could run down easily, but now I have a fan down here. And every time I try to run, the fan gets greater and greater and greater and greater until eventually this is like hurricane blowing winds that I'm trying to run against. How fast can I move against a hurricane blowing wind? Not very fast, especially with my gigantic cross sectional area. It's difficult. So, what this means then is if we thought about what should happen, well, if I thought about plotting the charge on this thing as a function of time, again, this thing starts off with zero charge, but eventually this thing has to reach a maximum charge, Q max, which we know is equal to then the capacitance times the. EMF, right? So if I charge this thing, what should happen then is that this is going to increase rather rapidly, but then it's going to start to slow down and eventually asymptote to the maximum amount of charge. It's going to take a very long time for this thing to reach maximum amount of charge. <clears throat> because again, initially it takes zero work for me to put this charge on here, so this is going to move rather quickly. Even if I have one charge on there or two charges on there, it doesn't take that much work to move them on there. But as I start closing in on the maximum amount of charge that this thing has, it takes a huge amount of work, it takes a huge amount of effort for me to put these things on here, which means it's going to slowly asymptote that to the maximum amount of charge. But if I think about the current, so let's think about how we plot the current over time. Again, initially, when I close the switch, let's say there's a switch here, this first charge is going to flow through the circuit as if the capacitor didn't exist which means that the first amount or the maximum amount of current, I max, would then just be equal to by Ohm's law, E divided by R. But again, as more and more charge goes onto here, the more force it has to overcome, the more resistance it has to overcome, the more wind that's blowing towards me, the current then is gonna slow down and slow down and slow down and eventually go to zero when this thing reaches maximum charge. Because when this thing reaches maximum charge, I can't force any more charge onto it, which means I can't have any more charge moving through the system, which means the current has to go to zero. So in this case, if I plotted the current over time, this thing should actually do this. Again, asymptote to zero. So this is what's called an RC circuit. So an RC circuit is I'm going to charge this thing up maximally, but it takes a lot of time for this actually to do that. We'll talk about discharging here in a second. So mathematically, we want to know how does this actually work? And the way we're going to do this is to use Kirchhoff's loop rules. Here it's nice, we only have one loop, so we don't have to do too much. So here's my resistor, here is my capacitor. So here I'm going to start off in this bottom corner. So I'm going to go across the battery, and the battery will go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So this has to be a positive increase of voltage. Now I'm going to go across the resistor in the same direction in which the current is going, which means that I'm going to get a minus I times R. This side will become the positive side. This is going to become the negative side. So I'm going to go across the capacitor in the, from the positive side to the negative side. So I'm going to get a minus Q over C, make it back to that corner, and that's going to be equal to zero. So basically, what we want to do now is use this to mathematically determine how much charge is on the capacitor as a function of time. From there, come up with the current and then see if that matches our conceptual expectations of what this problem should be doing. So let's do that. Now, remember by definition, current is equal to the change in charge divided by the change in time. So this thing becomes E minus dQ dt times R minus Q over C is then equal to zero. <laughs> now, what I wanna do is to get the dQ dt on one side. So I'm gonna add this term over to here. And I'm going to factor out a C, so I'm going to get a 1 over C times E times C minus Q is then equal to R 
times dq dt. Now, I'm going to divide both sides by R. So I'm going to get a 1 over RC times CE minus Q is then equal to dQ dt. So to solve this thing, I'm going to use what's called the separation variables. I'm going to do a trick. Since everything here has a Q on it, I want to get anything which has Q on one side and anything that's not a Q on the other side. Which basically, I'm going to take this term here, divide, and multiply everything by this term on the other side. So let's do that. So finally, I get a dt over rc is equal to dq divided by ce minus q. <clears throat> now let's integrate. So I'm going to integrate from 0 to t. I'm going to integrate this one from then 0 to q, where q is whatever the charge is at some given time. <clears throat> Left hand side, rc is simply a constant. That guy comes out. So I have an integral of dt, but what's the integral of dt? T evaluated from zero to T. So the left-hand side is just T divided by RC, nice and easy. The right-hand side, I'm gonna use a U substitution. So I'm gonna say U then is equal to CE minus Q, which means DU then is equal to minus DQ. So let's plug that guy in here. So I'm gonna write this a negative integral DU over U. But now I need to change my bounds of integration. So my bounds of integration are when Q is equal to zero, U is equal to CE. And then when Q is equal to Q, I have CE minus Q. So these are my bounds of integration. What's the integral of one over U to U? Natural log, good. So this becomes minus T over RC is then equal to natural log of U evaluated from CE to CE minus Q. Okay. So this is the same thing as the natural log of CE minus Q divided by CE. But again, what we're trying to solve for here is the charge as a function of time, which means I have to get rid of the natural log. So how do I get rid of a natural log? Take an exponential. So I finally get e to the minus t over rc is equal to ce minus q divided by ce. Finally, again, I want q. So I'm going to multiply this term over here. And then I'm going to subtract this term and add the q. So finally, what I get is Q is equal to C times E times one minus E to the minus T over RC. So this is the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. That's a negative sign up there. And I'm rolling into part of my T. There we go. Negative T over RC. Now let's analyze this and make sure it makes sense based off of what we talked about. So first thing is, at t is equal to zero, well, t is equal to zero, what's e raised to the zero? One, I have a one minus one, what's one minus one? Zero. So I have q is equal to zero. So this thing starts off with zero charge. My exponential then is going to asymptote to the maximum value. The maximum value is going to occur when time goes off to infinity. So then let's look at as t goes to infinity, I have e raised to the negative infinity, but what's e to raised to the negative infinity? That's the same thing as one over e to the infinity, but it's one over e to the infinity. What's e to the infinity? Infinity. What's one over infinity? Zero. So as time goes to infinity, that second term then goes to zero, and I'm left with simply CE, which is equal to the maximum charge. So this is the maximum charge on which this thing is going to acquire as time goes off to infinity. So this thing matches exactly this picture. So again, time is equal to zero, start off with zero charge. This thing increases rapidly, and then it's going to asymptotically then approach the maximum amount of charge, or the maximum amount of charge is simply C times T. What about the curves? Well, we know current, again, by definition, is the change in charge with respect to time. So this is then equal to CE divided by RC times E to the minus T over RC, which is then equal to E over R, E to the minus T over RC. 
<coughs> so here, again, that time is equal to zero. We have E raised to the zero, which is simply one. So I have then the current is equal to the maximum current, which is equal to E over R. As time goes off to infinity, in this case, we then have I goes to zero. Because here, T goes to infinity, I have one over E to the infinity, which again is equal to zero. Again, let's go back to our picture. This matches our expectation. Again, time is equal to zero. I have charge flowing through this thing as if the capacitor didn't exist. The only thing that exists is the resistor. So current has to move through with V over R. As this thing starts to increase with charge, the current then has to slow down and then eventually goes to zero when this thing goes to maximum amount of charge. So this is what we call a RC circuit. So an RC circuit, again, I have a resistor, capacitor, all it's going to do is the resistor is there to make sure current moves. Without a resistor, I can't have current. Right? That's what Ohm's law says. So this is just here to make sure that current's flowing through. I'm then going to charge up the capacitor. This thing is going to reach maximum amount of potential when it is fully charged. What's the point of an RC circuit? Anything that flashes or goes with a rhythmic fashion is an RC circuit. How many of us drove this morning to school? How many of us used our windshield wipers? That's an RC circuit. Here, you're charging a capacitor. That capacitor then causes it to move up. When it moves up, it discharges the capacitor, moves back down, starts over again. You charge a capacitor, moves up, discharges, you do it again. We're driving down the highway. They're doing work on the side of the road. There are flashing lights. Those are RC circuits. Inside of that light is an RC circuit, which causes a capacitor to charge up. Inside of there is gas. So what happens then is the capacitance or the potential across that capacitor exceeds the breakdown potential of the gas, which causes the gas to discharge and light up. Once it discharges the capacitor, it does it again. So anything that blinks or goes on a rhythmic type fashion is an RC circuit. So this is charging of an RC circuit. The other thing we can do with an RC circuit is we can discharge it. Once we discharge it, so once this thing has reached its maximum amount of charge, we can then take it out of the circuit, put it into a simple RC circuit with no battery. What happened in that case then is all the positive charges will start to move to go to the negative plates until eventually this is left with zero charge and this is left with zero charge. This will be discharging the capacitor. The way this one works is very similar. The only difference is it starts off with maximum charge, decreases, runs at maximum current, also decreases and goes to zero. So let me show you a little simulation event. So here, this is then, show you this guy. So what I have here is, this is a simple circuit. So this is just gonna charge up the capacitor and I'm gonna move the switch from the capacitor to the light bulb and we can watch what happens. So move this up to 1.5 volts. Move this guy up here. So what'll happen is if I'm running current through the light bulb, the light bulb will start off bright, get dimmer, dimmer, dimmer over time until eventually it will go to zero when this thing has zero capacitance or actually zero charge on the capacitor. The rate at which this occurs will actually be dependent on the capacitor in the resistor. And I'll point that out in just a second. So let's say I change the capacitance. So let me decrease this guy, charge that guy back up, move that over here. versus this guy, charge this guy out again. See the difference in the rates. That is, if we go back to our description, that's what RC is. So if we go back to our math here, this one over RC, RC is what's known as a time constant. 
So another way that we can actually write this is Q is then equal to C times E times one minus E to the minus T divided by tau, where tau is equal to R times C, which is what's called the time constant. The time constant then dictates how fast this thing either charges or discharges, which basically means that what? <clears throat> RC here, so when E is equal to minus one, i.e. when T is equal to R times C, what has happened then is that Q is equal to 0.67% of the maximum amount of charge. So what the time constant dictates then is how long it takes for this thing to charge up. The smaller I have RC, the faster this thing will charge up. The larger I have RC, the more amount of time it's gonna take for this thing to actually charge up or discharge. So for discharging, let me tell you about discharging, we won't do the math for discharging. But for discharging, what we find is that Q is equal to C times E, E to the minus T divided by tau. And the current is equal to E over R. Actually, let's call this Q max. Let's call this Q initial, E to the minus, let's call this I initial, E to the minus T over tau. Or again, tau is equal to R times C. So RC is simply how fast is this thing actually charging? So again, when it comes to charging, what RC then basically tells you is when this thing has reached about 67% of its maximum charge. That's the amount of time that it actually takes. So uh, good, we have something to talk about then on Wednesday. So, We'll do a couple examples of RC quickly on Wednesday, and then we'll re do a review, and then that's basically all we'll do on Wednesday. I'll see if I can come up with another group assignment for you. Uh, other than that, Thursday then, like I said, we'll start magnetic fields. So we'll do a little bit of the next exam four stuff before we actually get to the actual exam on Friday. And then Friday we'll have exam. All kinds of good stuff. So again, RC circuits are anything that pumps rhythmically. These are our RC circuits. So pretty much if any of you have a grandparents or something that has a pacemaker, that's also an RC circuit. Talk about those as well. What's that? Oh, it doesn't matter if it's before or after. Oh, if I have the resistance, then I would also up the time constant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here, that was just showing what happens with the capacitance, but I could also play with the resistor as well. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So the higher the resistor, the slower the rate. So the more time it's going to take for that thing to charge up. That's right. Yeah. So the bigger the resistance is, the slower the rates.